Hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity to pitch a few thoughts into the conversation. Um, I'm interested in starting off by just understanding uh, who's here, actually. Um, and I was interested if, uh, if you're from academia in any way, could you uh, sort of raise your hand and let us know? OK, good. I kind of wonked up the presentation a little bit, just figuring there might be some. Uh, no equations, but uh, sorry. And then how about from uh, NGOs or companies or anything like that? OK. And uh, anyone who doesn't fit into a stereotype so far? <laughs> OK. Great. Um, I want to talk about just a few things today. Uh, first of all, just reflect on our common mission. And uh, a theme that I want to share is that I think the NGO sector and the academic sector have a lot to learn from each other. Um, I know the example of One Acre Fund the best. It's not like we're a paragon of bringing evidence to action necessarily, but um, I do know this uh, example the best and want to share a little bit about how we think about research. Um, and then talk about sort of uh, the task ahead of all of us. So why are we here? What's our shared mission? Uh, it's kind of a big existential question, but the reason that we're here is that currently um, nearly one in 10 children die before they reach age five in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the majority of those deaths are related to hunger in some way. Uh, we're here because these girls deserve to drink better water than this. Uh, we're here because currently this person has less than a 50% opportunity uh, chance to finish secondary school. Um, I think we all share a mission, and I think it's very important that we remember that. Um, whether we're from the NGO sector or the academic sector, we're here to make a better world. Uh, and we're here, uh, specifically one theme of this symposium is agriculture, because agriculture is the dominant profession of the world's poor. If this slide represents all the world's poor people, farmers as a primary profession outnumbers every other profession combined. Um, I strongly believe that one of the solutions to global poverty is basically making farming significantly more productive. Um, and I think we need to work together a lot more. This is what I call the impact box. Um, it's fairly straightforward. On the y-axis is uh, impact per customer. Uh, on the x-axis is scale. And currently, uh, and then obviously the area of the box is the amount of impact that a particular intervention produces. Currently, I think that researchers are thinking a little bit too much about the y-axis. Um, there's a lot of great studies out there showing something that's hugely impactful for a 1,000 farmers. Um, so you can imagine a really long and skinny box standing up, uh, it's extremely vertical. Um, I think the NGOs are talking too much about scale. Uh, it's all about how big is your budget. Um, it's really absolutely horrifying. Uh, I, I live in rural East Africa to see the projects that you see on the ground. The vast majority of them produce absolutely no impact whatsoever, but they have a humongous budget. Um, clearly, uh, if we're going to increase the area of that box, we need to work together a lot more. So again, I just want to talk about the example of One Acre Fund. Um, just to, I want to first provide a bit of context. We only serve subsistence farmers in East Africa, and we have a model that significantly improves agricultural productivity. Um, we are an NGO, but we operate a lot like a business, so uh, a lot of our operation collects revenue from farmers that we serve, and we're growing quickly. Uh, we're currently serving 175,000 farmers, but we hope to serve more than a million households by uh, 2020. So we believe that there's three simple things that will change our cultural world. Um, seed, fertilizer, and training. After that, there's a whole list of things, but basically they're, they're not primarily responsible for the yield gap in Africa. Um, and this is an important point, I think. Um, if a lot of us are studying our culture, it's not the whiz-bang stuff that's going to change the world, it's the simple stuff that's going to change the world. And we believe that fertilizer is a pretty good example. Um, fertilizer was invented more than 100 years ago, but has not achieved significant adoption in sub-Saharan Africa. In Asia, they use 312 kilograms of fertilizer per arable hectare. In Europe, North America, and South America, more than 100 kilograms per arable hectare. Australia is kind of an odd case. In, uh, in Africa, they only use 13 kilograms per arable hectare, um, which is insane. Um, fertilizer, again, was invented more than 100 years ago. It's an ancient technology, but has yet to achieve significant distribution uh, and adoption in sub-Saharan Africa. Our organization is devoted to these three simple things, seed, fertilizer, and training, and significantly increasing their dissemination in sub-Saharan Africa. The way we accomplish that is, first, we provide a complete market in a box. So we organize farmers into groups, 
provide them with a productive asset loan for seed and fertilizer, train them, and provide them with post-harvest support. All of these things must be provided together. Um, seed and fertilizer without a loan are completely unaffordable. Uh, without training, uh, you can't just dump seed and fertilizer. That's not both not ir environmentally responsible. It's also not good for farmer profit. You can actually hurt your profit if you invest in seed and fertilizer without applying it properly. Uh, and then obviously there's no reason to um, produce more if you can't actually sell it. So we believe that this complete solution is something that's very important for the successful adoption of agricultural technology. Our second innovation is truly rural distribution. This is a map of the country of Rwanda. Before we uh, got started, maybe six years ago, there were only a couple dozen places on the entire map that you could buy seed or fertilizer. What we've started to do is create these market points. At each one of these market points, we have a full-time rural worker that provides training, that organizes delivery and drop-off within walking distance of the people that we serve. We're in the process of covering as much of you know, reasonably populated East Africa with these market points located no more than three or four kilometers apart. So that's the kind of the core of what we do, is provide this kind of complete uh, market in box and provide it within walking distance of the people that we serve. Uh, we're growing very quickly, so um, we're hoping to more than triple in size in the coming three years to produce approximately $50 million per year of direct value for farmers. We're also creating a new government services unit that partners together with African governments to create a similar amount of impact, hopefully. Um, so that's just all context about our organization, and I just want to chat a little bit about how we do research. So in addition to our core program, we also have a pretty big R&D operation. Um, that R&D operation evaluates new interventions and tests if they would be good for our farmers. Um, and so this is, you know, to the evidence to action piece, this is one example of how that's accomplished. Uh, two examples recently would be solar lamps. This year we'll sell about 55,000 solar lamps, and we believe that they have about a $50 per year household impact uh, in terms of saved energy cost. Uh, and we have a partnership with dispensers for safe water. We've together put more than 1,000 dispensers in the ground. Uh, and before we launch products like that, we have very rigorous evaluation. Uh, and then most of what we do is actually agricultural stuff. Um, so I kind of want to talk through our methodology for how we think about research. Um, when we're looking at a new intervention or a new product, we evaluate four things. First of all, is the thing actually impactful? Will it generate at least, for example, $20 of household income for the family? And this is what I would say in our cultural field is the realm of traditional agronomy. In addition to that, though, I'm sure there's a lot of behavioral economists here. Um, adoptability is every bit as important. Do people actually want it, you know? The thing might be the holy grail, but if no one wants to actually buy it and use it, um, that's obviously, you know, pointless. So um, that's, that's sort of the area, I think, of behavioral economics. But if we really want evidence to turn into action, there's two additional criteria I think we need to pay attention to. One is simplicity. Um, so a lot of behavioral economics also addresses this, which is can the product be configured in a way that is absolutely idiot-proof? Um, so if, if you have even a 10 or 15% failure rate for very, very poor people, that's not a very good risk. Um, this thing has to work consistently 100% of the time. And then the operability. Um, so this is something that research doesn't traditionally think at all about. Um, an example would be bananas. Uh, bananas are a great product for farmers, but scaling up bananas, if we were to try to sell bananas to all of our farmers in Kenya, we'd have to buy up the entire country's supply of tissue culture bananas. We'd also have to deliver a live product um, at more than uh, 500 distribution points. Um, the operability, some of the stuff behind making an intervention work at scale is absolutely critical to the R&D that we do. Uh, to do so, that, this is just sort of like how we think about research. I think the the agronomy, also the behavioral economics of it, but also really important is actually making this stuff actually operate as a business. To do that, uh, we have like this uh, framework where we test things in our trial plots. That's what we call phase one. We then will take 100 farmers and set up side by side plots. They have a, a control plot next to a randomly assigned intervention plot. Then we will do 1,000 uh, farmer trials. Then probably we go back and do a couple more 100 farmer trials, fix some things, and we come back and do some more 1,000 farmer trials. It takes years of work to get something to successfully operate in the field. And then critically, uh, the trial eventually has to be done with at least 50,000 farmers to see if this thing can actually scale. Can it actually be operated as a business? 
I want to quickly walk through just one example intervention. Um, keeping an eye on time, pretty good. Um, which is grevillea trees. Uh, trees are a fantastic investment for farmers, really good long-term income, uh, lots of benefits. Basically, Sub-Saharan Africa has a substantial tree deficit, um, but it requires a lot of behavior change. Currently, trees are thought of as more something grown by nurseries and skilled practitioners. Farmers go to nurseries to buy trees. Unfortunately, that's not very scalable. We think trees could be grown from seed, and that countries could grow many, many more millions of trees if they really germinated them from seed. The other behavioral problem is that farmers tend to harvest trees too quickly, um, only after a year or two, um, because they're tempted by the income. But trees really should be kept in the ground for a longer amount of time. So I want to talk about the product design here. Um, what we decided to do is distribute 700 tree seeds to every farmer that we serve in Kenya. Uh, the problem is that the average farmer is only getting 25 successfully viable seeds, seedlings, planted in their field. It's very hard, actually, to plant trees. So in our early phase nursery tests, we worked on a whole variety of different interventions to try to make this easier for the farmer to do. An example is the seed bag. It's like a uh, polythene bag that holds um, a seed and soil mixture compactly and makes it easier to germinate the stuff from seed. And so, um, you know, and it really matters. If you add one additional seedling successfully viable in the field, that's like a $10 value after waiting for five years. Um, so that some of the early stages were just around the product development itself. Then we started to put this stuff into farmers' hands in the field and sort of saw what happened. Um, and we found that there were, in the nursery, two agronomically equivalent ways of growing trees. You start from the seed bag, you go to a big nursery, you know, like a 10 meter by one like raised bed in your field, and then into like the field. Um, or you start with a bag, then you put in these little plastic sockets, and then you put it into the field. A agronomically, these are equivalent. But um, they are radically different in terms of the farmer's ease of use and adoptability. So we tested both configurations with more than 500 farmers in the field. Um, and turns out that socketing, despite being way more work, and my personally what I thought was not going to work, um, proved to be far superior to the other method. Turns out that if you have all these plastic sleeves, it feels super official. You want to fill every sleeve. You feel bad if you don't fill every sleeve. You end up with a lot more trees. Um, so this is an example of you know some of the development effort. Another behavioral problem is that farmers will tend to uh, take trees out of the ground way too quickly. They get tempted by the income. Uh, but the problem is that like, trees grow exponentially in value for the first five to seven years. So they really shouldn't be. It's a terrible investment decision. So currently in the field, with several thousand farmers actually, we have a variety of trials. An example is of a small plot. The farmer makes a pledge when they plant the tree. Uh, a plot sign, and they put up a sign next to their trees saying, I'm going to leave these for my little child, Christine, and this is going to be her school fund in 10 years or something like that. Um, we're trialing these little plastic rings. You put a big ring around the tree when it's first planted, and then by the time the tree fills the ring, that's when you're OK to harvest it. You know, lots of little things like that. Um, we have a, a bunch of randomized uh, interventions in the field, and we'll see like what works. That's going to be a really long trial. And then operability. And I don't want to bore you with all the boring details, but um, there's no tree seed supply for this particular variety in Kenya. So we had to buy up the entire country's supply, and we also had to expand it, working with the suppliers available. Um, seasonally, we hire a dozen labor to physically pick through um, 1,000 kilograms of tree seed and pick out the good stuff. Um, we have to have a new room built in one of our warehouses that's especially like aerated. So this, and then it's, we tried plastic bags and paper bags and things like that. Um, seasonally, we hire more than a dozen labor um, who put together stuff into more than 75,000 individual packets of tree seeds. Um, the way that all of this stuff becomes a business, it can actually be sold to somebody, is very, very important because otherwise it's just a very interesting research study. Um, these trees, like one little packet of trees, has a potential to help my kid that's currently age five to finish their secondary school is potentially life-changing. Um, but it's got to also be scalable and operable. OK, so just to wrap up, kind of what's next? Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa alone has more than 220 million undernourished people. 
Um, paradoxically, most hungry people in the world are actually farmers whose profession is to grow food. And unfortunately, uh, those of us in the agricultural development space will probably have guaranteed employment for life. There's plenty of work to be done. Um, NGOs, I think, are producing scale, but very little impact. Uh, researchers, I think, are oftentimes producing really whiz-bang ideas that could theoretically produce a lot of impact, but fail to reach more than 1,000 farmers at the end of the day. We really need to learn from each other and work together. Although we see the world very differently, we do share a common mission of basically making the world a better place. No one here is satisfied with having a huge budget and not having any impact or producing a bunch of papers that don't actually reach anybody's uh, lives. And that's one thing that we really appreciate about working with SEGA is like you guys actually seem to care about like uh, helping actual people. Um, so I think there's possible lessons that we have for each other. Uh, the NGO sector, um, I think we need to care more about impact. Certainly my organization, um, I think we're still playing catch up and this year we're planning to significantly improve um, our investment in um, M&E. Um, we really, really uh, think that this, there needs to be a lot more rigor in this field. Uh, the whole purpose of our organizations as NGOs is to produce impact for real people. It is absolutely insane that we're not measuring it with a, a greater level of rigor. Um, so I think that the NGO sector in general needs to significantly increase our R&D capacity, our quality of real measurement, um, and basically start producing better results for farmers. Uh, I think for researchers, um, I think probably the people in this room from like, from SEGA, <laughs> IPA, um, JPAL, uh, Evidence Action, stuff like that, the people in this room are obviously a little more action oriented, right? But um, here are some ideas. Um, one is, you know, I think there's an increasing number of jobs in the NGO sector that are quite interesting for people that are committed to measurement. Um, my or own organization, for example, has um, three open positions for M&E associates in the field. Um, but obviously, it's still a lot of people remain in academia, and I think that the things I've seen uh, in trials in the field are, I think, could use a larger N. They could also use larger land sizes, so often this stuff is trialed in very unrealistic conditions for extremely small plots of land. Um, I think, and then also, like, if we're interested in getting the study actually scaled uh, after, after it's published, um, working with scaled partners, not just any partner, but partners that actually intend to bring research to a significant scale, I think is very important. Working with those partners throughout the course of the study. So uh, when we sit down with SEGA, for example, and we look about study ideas, um, there's like a Venn diagram and the intersection of what SEGA's interested from an academic perspective and what we're interested from a scale-up perspective is, you know, is limited, but there are things in there. And that's, that's a sweet spot. When the academic is interested, we learn a lot from them, we do a credible study, but then we also scale it up. So, yeah, um, so it's a bit of like a, a rallying cry. I, I really hope that we can sort of increase uh, the amount of collaboration that we have between academia and the NGO sector. Uh, we need to start thinking about scale and impact, not just scale or impact. So, thanks, I think we have a little bit of time for questions, and yeah. Um, one of the questions we got um, right off the bat was how you came to this journey and how you, you know, you did an MBA at Kellogg and maybe we're on a different sort of track. I think you had done consulting before you, you had mentioned that. How did you come to One Acre and, uh, um, and sort of change course and, and adopt this, uh, this mission? Yeah. Um, so I... I uh... I basically like met two farmers, one that was yielding two tons of food on an acre, and her family was just thriving. Uh, and then her neighbor was yielding four times less food, she had lost a child, uh, and that just deeply affected me. And I started asking questions like, what's the difference? And uh, it was just simply seed, fertilizer, and training. It's absurdly simple what we need to improve agricultural productivity. And then uh, I started with a trial of 40 families, giving them seed and fertilizer loans and training and stuff like that. And it worked and we, we scaled it up. But it's, uh, I think it's exactly what all of us are doing, uh, is spending as much time as we can in the field. Actually, that's another thing. I think all of us can, can spend more time in the field learning from the people that we serve. Um, observing differences between households and behavior, and then finding the things that kind of, where little tweaks make a humongous difference in somebody's life. Great. Um, there's, a, I think, three questions around 
the R&D that One Acre does. I think people were very interested in that. And, and one of the themes that's coming through in some of these questions is how One Acre decides to allocate resources between the actual expansion of programs that are working versus that new R&D. And so you guys are a little different than some NGOs in putting a lot into all this R&D you were talking about. What's your uh, decision-making rule or process? You went through some of it, but maybe you could tell us more about that. Yeah, when we evaluate R&D projects, we look at um, that impact box. So what do we believe would be the impact per adopter times how many adopters do we think that we could get? Um, there's an additional element of R&D, which is risk. So um, we have ideas that have probably like a 1% chance of ultimately working, but could be totally game changing. Or things that are very high probability of working, but you know, add like $10 of income per family. And so uh, we sort of value all three of those factors in, a, in actually a fairly mathematical way, uh, which is the multiplication of impact scale and risk probability. And then, um, yes, yeah, some of those things work and some of them don't. Um, there's a very different kind of question, but pretty interesting, which says, given your focus on hunger, should one acre do more to deal with um, population growth? in the areas you work in. Uh, so you're, you're working on the, this person says, you're working on the numerator, why not work on the denominator? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have a new theme this year which we call long-term impact. So we have a repeat relationship with farmers. It's very unique. It's not just a one-time transaction. <clears throat> Is it the best avenue um, long, in the long run for Africa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we are concerned about the long-term potential environmental impacts of everything that we do. Agriculture and environment are intricately tied together. Um, so a farmer's long-term success has everything to do with their, the stewardship of their environment. And that's why one of the first trainings we do with farmers is to increase the organic matter in their soil, which is a really critical contributor to plant health. Uh, regarding fertilizer specifically, um, we use a, a technique that we call micro-dosing, which is to apply, it's something like seven times less fertilizer than an American farmer would, would apply. It's very low amount. And we believe that the marginal return at that, at that low dose is very, very high. Um, once, you, once the dosing gets too high, th then you really, it, it's very difficult to control the environmental impact and that kind of thing. And uh, we do closely monitor a, a wide variety of environmental indicators. Because I agree, like there's no, it would not be good to get short-term results at the expense of the, uh, the farmer's environment, which basically means very poor long-term results. So uh, I think philosophically we share, and we're actually supported by quite a few environmental supporters, um, we share that the same view that the long-term results are what matter, uh, and that very much depends on environmental health. Um, so we'd be happy, we could talk for a long time about that, but I think we share the philosophy hopefully with uh, the person who, who put that input in. I had a question, actually, Andrew. So I, I really enjoyed the breakdown you had about impact and scale and, 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 and thinking about things that way. And I completely agree with the uh, importance of uh, NGO academic um, collaborations. Um, given our experience working together and what you've sort of seen in this, in this space, do you, do you have any more kind of concrete, specific suggestions for how we can seed these kinds of collaborations? Um, what, what have you learned that would sort of be a good idea going forward for making this more common? Yeah, I wonder. I mean, it's interesting because traditionally, like, NGOs have very little interest in meeting academics and vice versa. And um, I don't know, one thing I personally would like to see in the field is, uh, you know, living, uh, living there, I, like, I've become friends with many uh, of these, like, uh, research people that you employ in the field and stuff like that. And then the PI comes for, like, uh, like a week or two, and uh, <laughs> everything goes to hell, you know, for a week or two. But um, I think uh, um, it'd be cool to see you out in the Is that really what happens? <laughs> yeah. I thought that was just normal. The amount of freak out that happens is, is amazing, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it'd be, it'd be great. You know, some of the world's greatest interventions were, uh, were born when uh, academics, like, spent a lot of time in the field. Um, like the deworming work, for example, dispensers for safe water. There's this great intervention, sugar daddy training that I'm trying to, that I think deserves more scale up. And, um, you know, when really smart people spend time, like, really in the field, like, for months at a time, just, like, learning, learning, learning. I know it's hard to find the time. Um, I think really great things happen. And then we interact more. And, you know, on our end, we should come to universities more often. We hardly ever do. And, 
Yeah, I think you know we just need to spend more time on each other's turf. I would say. Great. Yeah. I just got the signal that we've we've run out of time. That was a great session, Andrew. Thanks so much again for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>